This year at ESMO, we will be presenting the uh, most recent analysis of the OnCOVID registry. OnCOVID is the largest European registry study that since February 2020 has collected um, prospectively evidence around the impact of COVID-19 in patients with cancer. This is a tumor agnostic registry that collects data on patients with solid tumors, with hematological malignancies. And in the most recent analysis, we have concentrated specifically on the topic of long-term sequelae, long-term outcomes from patients who have actually survived COVID-19. Um, a lot of evidence is already out there to suggest that patients um, have a fairly high fatality rate from COVID-19. The first studies reported 20, 30 percent um, of patients dying when you know they will be um, getting a you know, potential COVID-19 infection. Uh, now the evidence is evolving and a lot more emphasis is put on what happens to people who had the infection, survived it, how are the outcomes going to be like uh, in the long term? So the, I think the original part of our study is that we are the first um, study specifically looking at cancer patients that documents a prevalence of 15% of uh, sort of medium term um, oncological and COVID-19 related complications in patients uh, with cancer who had COVID-19 previously. Um, it is interesting because this 15% resonates pretty much with uh, what is evident also from non-cancer patient population. We know that this is pretty much what to expect in terms of um, you know, prevalence of COVID-19 complications. Uh, in our study, we looked at what were the features that uh, at baseline, so prior to COVID-19 infection, uh, were linked with an increased chance of getting long-term COVID complications. And it is quite interesting that most of the features were relating to the severity of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection rather than oncological features. But the more severe the COVID-19 infection was, uh, you know, the number of complications, um, the need for, uh, for example, non-invasive ventilation, COVID-19 specific therapies such as steroids, um, antivirals, uh, 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 interleukin-6 inhibitors. So those features during the COVID-19 acute phase were actually predicting for that 15% of patients that would actually have long-term consequences from COVID-19. Um, so what are these consequences? So the vast majority of patients uh, basically present to the oncology clinic after having had uh, you know, full, full virological clearance from, from SARS-CoV-2 uh, with a number of symptoms, the most uh, highly prevalent one being fatigue, respiratory symptoms, uh, but we also documented a number of other symptoms such as neurocognitive changes. So people feeling uh, you know, unable to concentrate, unable to um, you know, live uh, you know, a meaningful quality of life. Um, and I think this is quite important because when we looked at those people who had symptoms uh, of, that were deemed as being COVID related, their survival from the point of first oncological reassessment, when they came back to clinic and be reassessed to restart treatment, uh, was actually heavily influenced uh, by uh, the presence of, of, of complications. So this is a very important message because to a certain extent, it enables us to recognize that beyond the acute effect on mortality from COVID-19, which is recognized and it's in, you know, in the guidelines, we know that this is something to protect our patients from. There are also perhaps more subtle and more long-term complications from COVID-19 that go beyond uh, surviving the acute phase. And we know that these affect uh, the long-term oncological outcomes. And I think prospective research efforts should really be aimed at, first of all, understanding what are the causes, both immunological as well as, um, you know, oncological potentially, um, for um, for this proportion of patients that have long-term effect, and also try and correct them. Try and be in a position where we identify the long-term challenges early, we identify the long-term symptoms early, the long COVID syndrome early, uh, and we try to address it. So in patients with COVID-19, there are a number of uh, rehabilitation programs trying to think about how to um, improve that sense of fatigue. And unfortunately, we know from other coronaviruses, such as MERS, that uh, patients who experience long-term fatigue often have symptoms for up to 40 months um, after clearing the acute infection. So this suggests that there is a population of patients with cancer that have been affected by COVID who are likely to experience long-term deterioration of their quality of life. The last and I think most interesting finding 
from our study is the fact that those people who have had uh, particularly troublesome complications were also less likely to resume treatment. So we specifically looked at those patients who were on systemic anti-cancer therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy prior to the COVID-19 infection, so four weeks before. And we looked at how many of those patients that were being actively treated resumed the treatment at the end of COVID-19 infection the first time they were seen in clinic. And actually, we found that there was a striking difference in patients who had long-term complications from COVID. So a lot of people after COVID were not able to resume treatment, either because the disease had progressed, but most importantly, because they had long COVID, because they had long-term complications, the fatigue, the breathlessness, the symptoms were actually impacting on the ability of physicians to feel safe to prescribe more chemotherapy, more immunotherapy, more targeted therapies. And I think this is, again, a very important message. So COVID and the impact of COVID goes beyond the simple uh, mathematical look at mortality in the first place, but extends way beyond um, the fact that, you know, even in patients that COVID-19, where COVID-19 was, 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 was cured, essentially, um, you know, there is still a proportion of patients that will, will have adverse outcomes. And we have to factor that in when we, when we see patients in clinic. So the clinical implications are of our findings in terms of detecting that 15% of patients with long COVID, I think has got to do with the need to potentially change our services, be again, once more, even more holistic than what we, you know, we, we are trying to, to strive for uh, and try and think about those sort of grayish symptoms, the fatigue, the tiredness, the, the breathlessness, uh, and try and offer our patients uh, adequate support. Uh, I personally think that not all the clinical services nowadays have got that uh, particular level of support in place. I know many different centers in Europe are actually starting to build sort of long COVID clinics, um, a sort of multidisciplinary space where patients can talk and, you know, about the symptoms and can get specialist advice. So breathlessness for, for fatigue and for all the other neurocognitive symptoms. I think we are once again, uh, pushed outside of our boundaries uh, in oncology because most of the symptoms, most of these long-term consequences attain more to the survivorship aspect of cancer. And you know, some of us might have those skills in terms of how to address them, how to think about rehab programs, but others may not necessarily be fully aware. So you know, my, my take home message from our research is to read the findings, understand that 15% is actually a fairly high proportion of people that might have long-term consequences and try and be flexible in terms of, you know, the patient follow-up and don't hesitate to refer uh, to colleagues who might be, you know, perhaps more versed in terms of thinking about how to control uh, these long-term symptoms. So there is a lot that still needs to be understood in terms of what drives uh, long COVID syndrome. This is poorly understood even, you know, in general from the point of view of the general aspect of, of, of you know, COVID care even in patients without cancer. There are a number of um, suggestions out there. Uh, the immunological inflammatory component of COVID per se might suggest that patients with more of a dysfunctional immune response at baseline might be the ones that will unfortunately have a more untoward course of COVID in the long term. And I think this is where the research should be aimed at, because if we think that there is an element of reversibility, if we think that there is truly a pro-inflammatory aspect that goes unrestrained, um, you know, even after full viral clearance from SARS-CoV-2, then we should really actively try and look at what are the molecular or the immunological pathways that we could potentially modulate here. So, you know, is it worth thinking about anti-inflammatories? Is it worth thinking about specific ways of tackling the pro-inflammatory response. I think these are very important research questions that we will have to answer in going forward. I think part of the um, uh, way we should take these results forward is also try and establish evidence-based uh, um, uh, protocols to uh, try and tackle the rehabilitation of these patients. Uh, so we recognize that these needs are new in our patients. We recognize the complexity of having to deal with systemic management of the malignancy, so restarting chemotherapy, restarting systemic therapy. But at the same time, you know, the symptoms that we're dealing with are, are fairly new to our clinics. And I think we need to structure services. We need to think about what is best for the patients so that these um, symptoms are recognized early and they are potentially treated or supported uh, early. The third thing is look at the long-term outcome. So um, in our study, the follow-up was 
in keeping with what we would call a medium term outcome. So essentially, from the point of view of the COVID infection, the median duration of follow up was around four months. And we expect that uh, from evidence in non cancer populations, that a proportion of people will still have symptoms six months down the line. And now we're starting to see evidence that protracted symptoms might last even longer. So another aspect for the Oncovid registry is certainly to continue in the prospective effort to document what is happening to this big cohort of patients that is now more than 3,000 patients big. And we're also hoping to collaborate with a number of other registries, for example, the ESMO Core Care Registry. We're hoping to collaborate with the CC19 registry in the United States, where you know, we could potentially merge all the data sets together and try and look as to whether there is geographical difference, for example, in the way um, COVID-19 has impacted uh, you know, uh, one particular region of the world as opposed to the other. And perhaps the last one, the very, very last comment, is about trying to see how the dramatic changes in the way we handle it. and now we also prevent COVID-19 with the vaccination programs might actually change this perspective. And I think, you know, if there is one take home message from our research taken all together, even though it's not purely stemming from, uh, you know, our own results, is the importance of getting cancer patients vaccinated. Because if it's true that by uh, generating a, a spontaneous protective immunity by having been exposed to COVID, there is that 15% risk of getting long COVID, I think there is even a stronger argument to say, well, if cancer patients are vulnerable and they can potentially suffer from up to 30% of mortality, there is also the added um, point of that 15% of long-term effect from COVID-19 that needs to be taken into consideration when counseling patients for, for vaccination. So I must thank uh, all the collaborators, all the patients, all the physicians that have actually contributed to this massive data collection. This really started as a project in the space of the week with plenty of telephone calls in the middle of a pandemic uh, to a group of physicians that were not just highly dedicated to the care of patients, but also highly dedicated to the generation of prospective evidence in this particular field. Uh, it is a project that started completely unfunded uh, that was taken on in our own time in a, you know, in a, in a phase where you know, the world was and, and the healthcare systems were you know, truly collapsing as a result of increased pressures. And so you know, really the, 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 thank, the thank you uh, is to all the people that cannot be here in the room with me, but they do deserve a lot of credit uh, for having put the data together. And most importantly also uh, Imperial College London who has funded through the Imperial BRC and the University of Piemonte Orientale in Novara with the statistical unit that has actually supported throughout with a, you know, a, a, an overarching database and with a lot of statistical support to make this possible, to make the generation of, almost of real-time data possible. So thank you very much for, to all the collaborators. And I think you know, the next challenge is to keep the, the registry alive and to continue to collaborate. So uh, you know, anyone out there that you know, is looking after patients with cancer is very welcome to join the consortium. This is a very open access type of uh, repository where every single investigator can potentially chip in and ask a number of questions uh, around COVID-19 and cancer. Thank <music> you.